It's hard to know where to begin with Cyberpunk 2077. This is one of the most anticipated games of the generation, with the firepower behind it that produced The Witcher 3, which at this point in time has received critical acclaim in the form of the most awarded video game of all time. You can see the DNA of CDPR's Witcher in the genetically tweaked dark feature of Night City 2. It seems that during development, CDPR has fallen into the role of Ripper Doc peeling back the layers of The Witcher and its formula, rearranging, and grafting a shiny new chrome exterior. But with this fresh out-of-the-clinic style, is there also substance in Cyberpunk 2077? Does it live up to the lofty expectations, and how has this augmentation from a third-person perspective fantasy game to a first-person RPG focused on a fluid class system fared for a studio now nipping at the heels of the top dogs of gaming? I initially wanted to get this review out before the embargo, but these are going to be my honest thoughts after 100 hours sunk into the game, having completed all the side quests and markers that are at least visible on the map, following life paths and seeing their influence on the story, picking different dialogue trees and regular side missions and seeing their effect, playing with differing builds and experiencing more than just one ending. I'm no longer in the honeymoon phase with Cyberpunk as well, in the sense that things have begun to become more black and white for me in terms of what's good, what's great, what's bad, and what's lacking. Also, do note that I did play this on a pre-patch review copy of the game, as well as have put time into the game after some of the hotfixes and patches using a 3700X CPU and an RTX 3080. Cyberpunk 2077 starts you off chasing three distinct life paths. The self-serving up-and-coming corporate path, the boots on the ground in the thick-of-it-all street kid path, and the family-oriented city-rejecting nomad path. These will all give you different introductions to Night City, as well as help you in your conversations with factions that are more aligned with your life path. I first chose Street Kid, which had you doing a favor for a barkeep in the district of Haywood, where he grew up and meant I could converse more easily with gangs and street scum alike. I did manage to play each life path in their entirety, with my favorite being my original choice of the Street Kid, and my least favorite being the painfully underwhelming corporate intro. These life paths were not overly meaty, considering this was touted as one of the more exciting RPG features for the game. They are all relatively on par with each other and offer three branching allegiances that will influence your dialogue options with those who you align with. Throughout the main campaign, the life path options did rear their heads from time to time in additional dialogue in the form of blue options, which allowed your character to extract more information, and yellow ones, which progressed the story forward, locking it into one trajectory. But you realistically will only experience the difference in your choices after multiple playthroughs. 100 hours in and the changes are too subtle for the average player to notice. In fact, other than the Maelstrom Prologue mission which has around 5 outcomes, I'm struggling to remember where my life path dependent dialogue option took me on a completely different route or established or severed a relationship with an NPC. The life path options do seem to be more dominant in the side content, but again to the effect where the changes were too minute to notice. This would be fine if the game established more of a need for replayability. After the life path specific beginnings, you're thrown into a 6 month montage of your escapades in Night City with Jackie, which is in my opinion one of the biggest mistakes in an overall satisfying main storyline. This montage severs the camaraderie built with Jackie by forcing the player into the role of passive observer and the most important first steps of getting to know Night City through the lens of an up and coming merc. You're then thrust into a situation where the character of V is well adapted to Night City and has grown a relationship with Jackie but we were never active participants in what is an integral part of growth of V and the relationship. We're stripped of experiencing some of the growing pains of our character, which also feeds into a point I'll talk about later, with the main storyline really needing one more strong act as a wind up for the knockout punch of the finale. That being said, despite this 6 month cinematic, Jackie is an extremely strong and likable character, and the prologue moves into an awe inspiring heist mission with him at your side as you attempt to extract a biochip as an entry point into the upper echelon ranks of mercenaries and the promise of more lucrative opportunities. The main story of Cyberpunk 2077, despite its shorter length, is paced elegantly and weaves its interesting characters into a gripping moment to moment story where dialogue plays a pivotal role. Cyberpunk has a sparkling cast of characters and is arguably its strongest element in combination with what I believe should be much more popular in the fully immersive first person system, which gives you the full autonomy to look where you please, whether that's at whomever is talking to you, the fringes of your peripheral vision, or even lost in thought completely away from the point of interest. This adds a layer of authenticity to every interaction you have in Night City. I remember getting into a car driven by one of these fantastic characters at the outset of the story, as it started to cloud over and rain in Night City. As this character began to discuss the hows and whys of the mission we were about to undertake, 
I found myself looking out of the windows at not only the awe-inspiring architecture and vertical scale of Night City, but simply the raindrops running down on the window. You ever remember sitting in the car as a child, betting on which raindrop would make it to the bottom first? This is something that this scene allowed me to think back on. This might seem inconsequential, but it was a nice moment where video game world and reality collide, and is a strong reason why people play story-driven narrative games. The autonomy of making anything in my field of view the center of attention, no matter how big or small, is a simple yet effective design choice. It's something that might become more of a passive feature as you play more, or even on additional playthroughs, but at first it really enthralls you into the experience, and even engages you more through dialogue, since you're mainly going to be using this to gauge the nuanced body language of the wide variety of characters that you'll meet. When it comes to body language and the believability of NPCs, this is another overwhelmingly strong element of cyberpunk. Animations, faces, and eyes of most of the main characters are encapsulating, raw, and real. There was a moment I was lying down next to a character who was reading my deeper thoughts and intentions. And the voice acting, the facial animation and attention to detail, and the freedom to make micro-adjustments with the first-person cinematic system coalesce to create this cinematic experience. There's this snap back to reality moment at the end, and it was a crude reminder of the nature of what I was involved with, but also the realization of how amazing this first-person scene system can be at pulling you in. Now this is a dialogue-heavy RPG, especially when it comes to the main story, but it's all exceptional writing. The cyberpunk IP created by Mike Pondsmith has a wide variety of lore terms and terminology, but it's all added in appropriately and within the right context so that even if you don't have knowledge on 2077's TTRPG predecessor, you can still follow what's being spoken about for the most part. The script is not overly cerebral, but it's strong in that it uses future slang in tandem with regular terms and it gives a sense that the characters you interact with are well adapted with the world around them. In typical CDPR fashion, there is a ton of crude language swearing and dark humor, and sets up the dark future as some sort of comedic noir film filled with corporate scum, violent factions, burnouts, and bums. The main story sends you down this hallucinatory road of collided psyches, and a race against time to separate them. The marketing material has already mentioned this pre-release, so I think I'm in the clear when I mention that Johnny Silverhand's consciousness has merged with yours, the result of you lodging a biochip into your mind in order to keep it stable. Silverhand is a parasite, and you're the host, and the journey to free yourself from the mortal implications of this is the main objective. Obviously, in a cyberpunk dystopia, a helping hand doesn't come cheap, and your journey is punctuated with tough decisions following various crumb trails to find a solution to your conundrum. It's a great main story, and you meet some stellar characters along the way, but I can't help but feel like this journey was too short to give the emotional impact it could have delivered. One more strong act in the form of the prologue would have given a better overall experience, and one more strong act once you've met Johnny would have made the potential endings more impactful, and I think that either of these would have increased my enjoyment of the main story for different reasons. An increased prologue would have given me a longer process to acclimate to Night City to better align with my character whom I did feel detached from at times. The endings are extremely varied and have different epilogues depending on them. Of course, I got the worst ending during my first playthrough, just like I did with The Witcher 3, but all endings that I have seen are well done in capping the main storyline in extremely different ways. Going back to life paths, again they don't seem to matter in getting a specific ending, and all endings can be queued from one life path. Now let's talk about Johnny Silverhand. Keanu Reeves as a voice actor is perfect for one side of the duality of Johnny. His disparaging tongue-in-cheek remarks from a distance is something that Keanu naturally leans into. But when it comes to points of urgency in Silverhand's story, you can see the breaks in Keanu not fully stepping into volatile Johnny. For example, Johnny tells V to put a gun in his mouth and pull the trigger at one point. And it's so devoid of emotion or attachment, which makes it much more chilling. And at that point, Keanu really sells the Johnny that lacks empathy. There are also times where Johnny's talking about getting revenge on a certain mega corporation, which doesn't translate very well because it demands tapping into a state where you can sense his bloodlust lying under the surface. I'm not sure I necessarily got this in his delivery more often than not. There's also this third rare side of Johnny where he's real, raw, and emotional, which I thought was caught somewhere between the two performance-wise. Not fantastic, but not bad either. That being said, I was really pleased with Keanu's voice acting overall, and how he handled the character, since his dialogue is mostly strung together ramblings of cynicism and contempt. I recommend that you do plenty of main side content before finishing the main story, just because he does appear routinely as a devil or angel on V's shoulder, leading you to either make the choice you're going to anyways, or seeing a different side of the coin, separate from the influences of characters involved in that story thread through Johnny's commentary. It allows you to get to know Johnny beyond his main story motives, and he definitely has some very funny lines and critiques of the various adventures that you inevitably drag him to. Now just like with The Witcher 3, most of Cyberpunk's substance 
is embedded in its writing on full display in the game's excellent side quests. The game does not shy away from the wretched themes of the dark future, including abductions, rape, violence, torture, and even a very poignant quest on religion. The best of the best in cyberpunk are these quests that push the boundaries on how twisted the world has become, using futuristic texts such as Braindance as a vessel for telling these stories, or even as a set piece within the missions. In this case, the most potent stories in Night City use Braindance to help tell them. I don't necessarily mean that the quests using the Braindance editor are the best ones, but most of the better side quests use it in a more passive sense. That being said, I also did like Braindance editing sequences during my first playthrough, but I did wish that after the tutorial, the game wouldn't hold my hand so much in these sequences to make them harder. Now nothing changes in these Braindance sequences if you choose another playthrough, and they are pretty time consuming, so I think a couple different solutions to each of these BDs, as well as using them as moments of change, would have been much more engaging. Considering there is so much side content with so much flair, it's a shame that almost none of them dives into the main gangs in Night City with the exception of the mocks. The gangs are the focal point of the smaller open world activities in Night City including gigs and scanner hustles, which lack the narrative context to understand their motivations other than on the surface level. There's also a lack of in-depth detail about some of the more standout factions in Night City, like Trauma Team or Max Tag. They're kinda just there for the ride. The smallest pieces of side content can effectively be boiled down to Cyberpunk's version of bandit camps with maybe a bit more story elements here in the form of lootable shards after clearing them. Although there are a lot of them, they're effectively the same things over and over. There's a group of three gangsters standing around, maybe in multiple pockets, and you massacre them and loot some sort of document or shard. Scanner hustles give more context through you listening in on NCPD channels on the nature of the warrant, and gigs are a bit more varied and come through your friendly neighborhood fixer. Again, these aren't fully fledged pieces of side content, but aren't as small as the random street encounters akin to the bandit camps. Lots of the added details on these smaller segments come in the form of shards, which are nice to have, but I also think audio logs would have allowed you to listen to these shards while doing other things like driving around the city or walking the streets to your next gig. Now let's talk about the city itself. Night City is a concrete jungle, and just like a jungle it has layers. In a jungle or forest you have a canopy, an understory, and an undergrowth, and the types of creatures in each of these layers vary. Night City is built in much the same way. From the undergrowth of Kabuki, you can see the sun stream through the billowing smoke of a nearby building. In the downtown area around city center, you'll be shoulder to shoulder with thick packs of ever moving crowds, and what I can only describe as Times Square on crack. The first time I passed over the bridge of Night City's equivalent to Central Park into the open cross section of downtown city center, I was blown away by the scope and detail poured into the look of the city itself. In Pacifica, you'll overhear locals reminisce about Haiti as you peer over a balcony with the clear sight of an abandoned theme park, a reminder of what could or should have been. In the noisier districts, you can hear the ambient noises of people chatting, the sizzle of pad thai, or the electronically generated promos of the latest and greatest consumerist toy emitted through the speakerphones next to towering ads. Rare weather effects include suffocating tufts of fog and acid rainstorms that tinge the sky yellow that you might only see at specific story moments, or every 25-ish hours during free roam sessions. Night City is easily one of the most beautiful cities I've seen in a video game and takes the best of Ghost in the Shell, Dread, and Blade Runner and somehow meshes it together where it's still believable in terms of layout. Add in the various ray traced effects and the city absolutely shimmers. I will say that interacting with the world is less awe-inspiring than simply observing. NPCs give the same canned responses as they did with The Witcher 3, which was to be expected, but I was surprised at how much of Night City's discovery and interaction takes place outside. Many doors are locked, making me think that these are areas reserved for DLC and expansions but ultimately make you feel like Night City is more of a painting than a playground. This is not a sandbox experience, but I also think that the interactivity of the world is lacking at times. You can't sit in a bar and take part in a drink, there aren't a lot of minigames, and vendors don't offer anything other than a spectator experience, which is odd considering this is a role-playing game. It's a bit of a shame since Night City is absolutely stunning, and the level of detail of the areas that you can actually enter is fantastic. Kabuki, for instance, offers the ability to bounce from rooftop to rooftop, and actually enter many of the dilapidated buildings, something that an area like city center doesn't try to replicate. In a city described as having a lot of vertical exploration, I was surprised that there wasn't more of it when free roaming. I love the rooftop areas that I did go to, many of which felt like their own aerial micro-communities in themselves, but it only happens once or twice in the main story and is almost non-existent otherwise. If the city itself in terms of aesthetic is a Pablo Picasso, then the soundtrack is the auditory equivalent. The music is masterful, from the haunting pulsing electronica that seeps into the scenes attributed to the relic and Silverhand, to the furious strumming of Carrie and Friends, 
to the diverse array of gang-specific combat music, to the musical genius of the composers on the OST, and the various talents sourced by CDPR to create 100% original songs. The soundtrack has a flavor of everything, and for lack of better ways to describe it, is something that you obviously need to hear to gauge. I found myself bobbing my head to a lot of the radio tunes, but it was the OST that permeated the main questline that really captured my attention. It's absolutely fantastic. Let's move into the combat in Cyberpunk. The fluid playstyle really does allow you to play how you want. More skilled players will use more elements of their kit, showcasing the depth and variety of chaining this fluid class system together, whereas your average player may still diversify in their perks and skill trees, but not stray too much from what feels comfortable. Combat in Cyberpunk 2077 ebbs and flows from very good to mediocre, depending on what playstyle you adopt. Gunplay at first feels slow and sluggish, but as you progress, and level up your abilities, you become an adept rifleman or gunslinger able to shoot with more precision and speed. This progression is fairly natural as you may not notice the small refinements and tweaks until you have a chunk of points invested into these skills, but I have to say once you hit a certain threshold, the gunplay becomes extremely rewarding. Katana and swordplay mechanically changes less so, but the impact of the katanas and blades right out of the gate does feel quite good. This means a smaller jump in the way katanas feel in your hand if you compare this to the leap that you'll feel with firearms. Katanas are tactile, light, and are animated with authority, slicing in a variety of cross patterns as you carve up your enemies like a Christmas roast. It feels fluid and powerful, and adding sliding and Karenzikov to this playstyle really makes you feel like a battle-hardened cyber samurai. I wish I could say the same about melee combat, which at its best is unrewarding. There is a boxing challenge quest that ups the ante on the excitement factor of these melee encounters, but at the end of the day, mechanically, it feels sluggish. The movement and bobs and weaves of your enemies in these isolated encounters creates these nice standoff moments, but your mobility in these encounters when dodging an incoming strike or closing the gap is not very fluid due to the odd choice of CDPR binding the dodge as a double tap mechanic. I think in my early preview I did say that you could rebind it, but you actually can't. This is another issue I have with the game, and that keybind remapping is incredibly archaic. The accessibility is just not there. It's also hard to know the reach of your opponent and when you have actually taken a punch or kick. The Netrunner and Stealth playstyle can be incredibly powerful, with investment into the right trees and with the right components. Once you get to a certain point, it starts to feel like Cyberpunk's combat is a point and click shooter when using quick hacks. And the hacking minigame is also this pseudo Sudoku style game that has enough depth here to keep me engaged, especially when you unlock a deck with more buffer room to hack all devices. Weapons themselves feel very satisfying. There is a mod system, although the mods typically don't augment the way that you actually use them and mainly just buffs damage. At the most, there is a non-lethal mod which turns even firearms into non-lethal variants. And there is also a smart link cybernetic which allows you to use the tracking features of smart weapons. But again, there isn't a ton of variety here. Things like the bullet deflecting mod for the katana has since been removed, and unless you're super into min and maxing, these will mostly be your standard damage or defensive buffs. The weapon diversity is enough to allow you to find something in your niche that you will like, but you'll often swap it out altogether once you find a stronger weapon. You can of course upgrade your weapon in the crafting menu, but weapon drops will scale to your relative level, and it's often a waste to do this when you will inevitably find the variant down the line that is stronger. In this sense, I didn't find a weapon that I had any attachments to until midway or a little past that throughout the game. I did eventually find my go-to revolver in my first playthrough, but at that point I was well past the midway mark. Augmenting the body through cyberware is also important in creating a specified gameplay feedback loop. Most of these are effectively stronger perks with some additional gameplay capabilities, but the most apparent changes come through the operating system and the arm augmentations. Your operating system can be more hacker focused through a cyber deck or more guns blazing focused through Sanvistan or Berserk cyberware, which create the biggest changes in combat. They're all unique enough and fun enough to warrant a spot in your gameplay. Arm augmentations are another feature, with my preference lying with the arm cannon and the Mantis Blades. The Gorilla Arms are useful for your boxing questline, and although the Mono Wire has been stripped of its remote hacking functionality, it is fun to use despite an overall weird hitbox. They're all good, but I never really relied on these augmentations too much, other than the projectile launch system, which felt a few tiers above the others in terms of damage potential. Speaking of combat, we have to talk about the AI. The AI in Cyberpunk is either not the greatest, or extremely buggy, or some combination of the two. Enemies are constantly blissfully unaware of everything around them, and even trip over fallen comrades, but there will be times where they take cover, blind fire around walls, or become aggressive at the right moments. The problem is that more often than not, they don't do this. Police will also spawn out of nowhere and kill you extremely fast, and the wanted system extends the length of a city block, where once past that they will forget about your existence altogether. When it comes to cars, the driving isn't awful, but the sensitive handling will make it feel like at times you're driving over a thick layer of ice. 
something that Night City obviously would never have being in California in the year 2077. This is made worse by the exclusion of a pan out feature on the minimap and a GPS system which will have you doing circles around the city or screeching on the brakes to make an exit at the last minute. The visual and sound design of these cars are a redeeming factor here, but driving in the city can bog down your experience if you're not paying very close attention. Finally, we have a flurry of bugs and performance issues. This is from someone playing on a PC with a 3080 and a 3700X. There were enough to hamper my experience in the game, with the most annoying ones being audio bugs, like combat music not ending when it should've, bug main quest lines where the NPC would just stare at me, overlapping dialogues, the inability to choose a certain dialogue, pop-in, clipping issues, open world breaks in the forms of drivers grinding across barriers, and much more. I had a fair number of issues with frame drops as well, even with DLSS enabled. Overall, it did hurt my experience playing, and didn't change drastically from my pre-release review copy into the latest patch which is 1.05. It's gotten better, but not enough where I can say it's release ready. And this leads me into my conclusion on Cyberpunk 2077. All in all, at times it makes me feel like I'm playing two different games. There's a clean, engaging main and side narrative here, but also a fragmented open world that could have benefited from more of an evolution from CDPR's last game. The more story-driven elements of the open world are wondrous, as is the world itself, but I can't help but feel like CDPR just ran out of time here. The game in many ways is a shadow of what was promised in the 48 minute demo. In hindsight, the marketing here was always going to be over promising and under delivering. CDPR did themselves no favors by claiming that Cyberpunk 2077 would be cutting edge in every single department. Despite all the negatives, CDPR also delivers on an overall fun and engaging experience, and I've really enjoyed my time with it. The stories, the characters, the diversity in combat, the city and the structure of it, the graphical fidelity and art design are all in a tier which gamers will notice as being a cut above, and in the grand scheme of things, it starts to blur some of the things Cyberpunk gets wrong. At the end of the day, for me, that's what mattered. As I'm recording this audio, my mind is not here. Maybe it's being housed in some crystalline matrix somewhere deep in the depths of Mikoshi, or maybe it's just lost on thoughts of Night City, despite its flaws, inadequacies, and shortcomings. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, enjoy your holidays, and I will see you in the new year for more Cyberpunk and more gaming.